In this video, we're going to explore the kinds of functions that we will be using in our physics type modeling. And we're going to dive deeper into this particular kind of function. So this is the one to get really started on, where we sink our teeth into the challenges of mapping trajectories of objects in space over time. What this is going to entail is a single number in the input and a pair of numbers, or of course more, could be triples, could be fours. We're going to probably stick to twos and threes, pairs and triples. But the idea is that we're going to get two values back out or three values back out for a single time point. Just a quick notation here. This fancy R here means the all real numbers. And it's pronounced just R. <laughs> so we would say that T is an input in R or R1. To contrast it with the output over here, which is in R, looks like squared, but we would say this as R2. And the distinction here is that the real line with zero t going between negative infinity and positive infinity, that would be one real value that we can pick, contrasted with the plane, which has an x and a y value, all going out to infinity in both directions, and this would be R2, where we can move in both x and y directions. This kind of notation is going to be quite important, uh, just in general engineering, but also specifically when you take your linear algebra class next term. So the idea, though, is that we have a time value, and as time changes, we're going to have a single output quantity, but that quantity is going to have both an x and a y part to it. That's how we get around the multiple outputs. There's only a single X and a single Y that comes back. And we're going to explore how this maps perfectly onto our idea of a particle, an object, a spaceship, a car, some object moving around on a plane or in 3D space and captures this idea that at a given time, I'm only at one specific location, but that over time I'm tracing out some kind of trajectory. Let's go back to our earlier example of the green dot moving around in a circle. This captures this trajectory idea perfectly, where we have an x and a y coordinate. This time we're going to be looking at both of those, not simply just the height, but we're going to imagine this dot moving around, and we are going to focus to start with not necessarily time, just the angle. See how that plays out here. If we do a connecting line here, and we imagine the angle, then what we can do is study the relationship now in three columns between our angle, our x value, and our y value. The relationship, though, is not what it might have been in other tables. It's not one variable defines the next, variable defines the next. It's theta defines x, and then separately, theta defines y. When we look at this kind of scenario, if we imagine theta, again, in radians being 0, then that corresponds to this flat line here before we go counterclockwise. And we can read off on this chart here. This is an x location of 1 and a y location of 0. If we then reorient ourselves, and let's go the easy values here, let's go pi over 2 for theta. That's going to put us right at the highest point on the circle. So pi over 2, we're going to have an x of 0. We're going to be on the axis here, and a y value of 1. And if we do that again, this time with the full half circle, full half circle, just a half circle, and we use pi as our angle, we can see that we reach x equals negative 1, and our y is equal to 0, and we can see our patterns emerging here. If we go to 3 pi over 2 down at the bottom, we're again going to be at x 0, but y is going to be down here at negative 1, and so on. And again, this should be mostly familiar. This should be some flashbacks to earlier examinations of trig functions. What we can see with this is that our x value, if we take an arbitrary point here, we'll put it in the first quadrant just to keep life simple. If we imagine a point here and we connect it to the origin with this angle here, theta, what we get is a relationship, tuck this in a little tighter, we get a relationship that is the x coordinate, which is this side here, is the adjacent side for the angle. And so our x is equal to cos of theta. And if we want to write that as a function, we would write it out as x of theta equals cos of theta. Similarly, 
on this axis, we have our y value. And notice it's the opposite side from the angle we're discussing. So the length of that side is sine of theta. Or again, to match that same formulation, that same kind of syntax, we would say y of theta is equal to sine of theta. For every theta, there's a single y. For every theta, there's a single x. But together, they represent a location in x and y that we can take advantage of and analyze further. Now, most of that isn't the way we describe it in a physics context. Usually, we would imagine something like this as a particle moving over time. That's going to be our big change. Let's take the easiest possible time frame where we complete one revolution in two pi seconds. Well, that tells us that we're exactly mapping our angle onto our time value here. So for exactly the same chain of logic, through the exact same chain of logic, if we have our theta here, in this context, our x of t is going to be equal to, drawing our horizontal and vertical lines here, our x is still the adjacent, but now it's going to be cos of t. And y of t is going to be sine of t. And a compact way to represent this is in vector format. So R is a typically used letter that's not X, Y, or Z, so there's no confusion with position. We put a little arrow hat on it uh, or indicate it in bold and a lot of the typeset information. And then we simply list off the coordinates, cos T and sine of T here. And it's implicit with the vectors that we saw earlier that this is the x coordinate and that this is the y coordinate that comes second. So we leverage the idea of standardized notation to more quickly represent something fairly complicated like this to get started in vector format where we can implicitly see quickly what the x and y coordinates are without having to write out a longer form notation. But this is our first to output function uh, for a single input, tracing out the position of a green dot moving around a unit circle at two pi seconds per circle, or two pi seconds per revolution. And yeah, let's just talk a bit about uh, the nomenclature around this. What, if we're gonna spend some time looking at these, we better have some terminology. Uh, we call this a vector valued function. For other reasons, it's often called a parametric curve as well. These are equivalent terms. The vector valued function, I think, is the easiest way to see it at our stage the output value is a vector because we have cos t and sine t. So that's our output. The parametric curve is maybe a little less obvious. The idea is that we get a curve as the output. For example, we're drawing out this arc in the xy plane. The parametric part is driven by a parameter. And parameters are one of those wishy-washy words in math it can mean a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. Um, but here, t would be the parameter. Our time value is what we're looking at for the input to the function. So this nomenclature is just changing the emphasis. Uh, the vector valued function says we're going to get a single vector out at each time value. The parametric curve applies to the same formula as well, but simply emphasizes the fact that it's going to be a curve that we're tracing out based on a single input, a single parameter, t. It's worth emphasizing at this point that this vector notation is nice and compact, but it is not the only way to represent these. It's just a convenient one. As we saw earlier, we could have exactly the same information encapsulated in two separate functions that are single input, single output, with x of t equals cos of t, y of t equals sine of t, and we package those together, then that is entirely equivalent to the vector form. It just saves time to write it this way and often gives us some insights rather than having all this overhead of saying x and y when we know we're dealing with x and y's in a certain order. Next up, we're going to see how we can animate these kinds of trajectories, these kinds of curves, using software, MATLAB, that's freely available to you. The idea being, when we have more complicated functions than simply sine and cosine, 
it may not be obvious what kind of trajectory is being traced out there. And so having software to assist us can help us sketch or understand or get that graphical view on these kinds of functions.